Kiora. In a manner, in a reo, in a waka, a tune, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto, koto. Uh, I would start any, any lecture for students um, at my university with, with that statement. Uh, if I was at a conference, um, it's, it's very common for people to, to, to start off, especially this green line here. Um, and because uh, it p positions myself and uh, in my country and in the ethical relationships that I have with that green line. Um, and uh, so have we become too ethical uh, in my country? Um, I think we've conceptualized Maori research ethics, but we haven't operationalized them, just to pick up on the last person. Uh, and I think, I think Canada uh, does it better. And, and sort of no one today has really sort of highlighted uh, TPS2, and I think it's the way to go. I think we should all become Canadians. Uh, so that's my, uh, my, my focus of today. So just to give you a translation of in a mana, I, I want to recognize all of the, the people that are here in, in a reo. I want to recognize the languages, the people that I had dinner with last night, the, 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 the Greece, the Dutch, the, the Norwegian, the, uh, the English, the Welsh, all of the languages that are, that are here. And the next line really works, especially in New Zealand, in a waka. It basically sort of says, I want to recognize the canoes that brought you here to New Zealand. And, and I want to say that everybody probably, uh, if you were in, in New Zealand with me right now, came on a canoe of some kind, um, that you came from somewhere else. Because the next line, A to an A, uh, actually says something quite different. It also recognizes uh, to those who were here before all of us arrived. Tangata whenua. Tangata meaning people, whenua meaning land. Tangata whenua, people of the land, First Nation. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, koutou, koutou. Greetings, greetings, group greetings to all. So in, in, in a sense, um, this, is a, this is an ethical relationship that I, that, that I have the, to the people who are actually there before. And it's actually, it's very different from probably any country that's sitting in this room, other than that if you were born in New Zealand and you spent the first two years of your life, Rachel, in New Zealand, you're still a uh, Tangata Pākehā. So I'm Pākehā, I'm not Tangata Whenua. Uh, so, and this here is based on, on a treaty that was uh, signed between Queen Victoria and, um, and on my behalf, uh, Lieutenant Governor Hobson and the chiefs of the Maori, uh, 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 of the 400 chiefs in, in New Zealand. And the three articles of the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, one in terms of protection, and I want to highlight protection today. So the, the Queen Victoria was saying that she was going to protect the cultural practices, the, 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 the protocols, the customs, the language, the people, of who were signing this treaty. And then we were going to give participation. And I think participation is the most important of the three, but it's the one that's been trivialized and dro dropped off. And that, particu that participation is that you will be have an active relationship with Pākehā and you will engage in the bounty of New Zealand in terms of housing, education. It doesn't actually say that in the treaty, but, it's, but that's basically what, what they're sort of saying. Uh, and also, the third article of the Treaty of Waitangi is about a partnership. That the when we make a decision about how New Zealand will actually operate, we will do so in a consultative way uh, with the treaty partners, the Crown and Maori, and we will work in good faith. Uh, well, so that was 1840. A lot of promises uh, were made in 1840. And uh, so we'll just jump ahead uh, to 1970, uh, where uh, Linda Tui O.I. Smith is saying that research is a dirty word. So a lot of research has gone on, and she uh, and she's writing in 1999, but she's talking about the 1970s from the vantage point of the colonized position, which I write and choose the privilege. The term research is linked to imperialism and colonialism. The word itself, research, is probably one of the most dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. So something about research didn't quite work. Re research has been extractive. Re research has been Eurocentric. Research has been on, not with. So uh, research has not been good for Maori. So in terms of that notion of participation, uh, there was something that didn't quite work. So if you look at some, some, some stats for New Zealand in the 1970s, 
uh, you'll see that uh, for uh, Maori males, uh, life expectancy is 61 years. The pension, you get the pension at 60, so you get one year of the pension and then that's it. Uh, Pākehā, they, well, they do a little better, 69, they get nine years. And for females, it's, a, it's actually a, uh, a greater gap between the, the two. So there's a real disparity in terms of health. And I think that word disparity is something that I want to sort of highlight today. Uh, where Māori have done really well, uh, being facetious here, is in the prison population. The, po the po population of, of Māori is 13%. But you'll see in female, uh, the Maori in prison is for 58% uh, of the prison population, and for males, it's 51%. So there's something uh, about the disparity in life chances that didn't actually develop uh, in those years from, from, 19, uh, from 1840 to 1970. So we had social movements all over the world in the 1960s, 1970s, Vietnam, <coughs> Paris. Uh, Chicago, uh, and in New Zealand, this, the, the, the picked up on the real the, the civil rights movement, uh, a group called Natamatoa. And Natamatoa started to say, well, let's honor this thing called the treaty. We, we signed it in 1940, let's honor, honor the treaty. And there was a very strong, strong response. And what developed was a, was a call among academics for a new type of research model and that model was called Kapapa Māori Research. So Kapapa Māori Research, uh, epistemologically, uh, was a, 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 a strategic position that, that challenges that dominant Western Pākehā construction of, of research. The second part of it was that research had to be in the control of Māori uh, rather than Pākehā. It actually had to follow a Māori protocol. And fourth, and this is the important part, is the essentialist part where uh, we were, the couple of Māori research was pr pr promoting uh, research by Māori for Māori. And I think that's really important. At the same time, really uh, leading academics, Michael King, a historian, uh, Joan Medge, an anthropologist, Jeff Sissons, uh, uh, an anthropologist, who were researching Māori, were basically pushed out were pushed out and said, this is, this is Māori-centred research, you don't belong here. And they went on to write, uh, Jeff Sissons went to the Cook Islands where they speak Māori and did research there. Uh, uh, Mike, Michael King changed his whole focus from studying Māori to studying Pākehā research. So we have a couple of Māori research and now we have a confluence, a confluence of events that take place in around the 1980s. And the first of those events is a, just a, uh, an act of parliament by the fourth Labour government who were trying to close the gaps with, uh, with, uh, with, with Māori and they, wanted to, they started to activate the three Ps. The three Ps are protection, participation and partnership. And we have those written into this particular legislation in 1987. We've got, a, we've got a model, we've, we've got an act of parliament that said nothing in, the, in this act shall permit the Crown to act in a manner which is inconsistent with the principles of, of uh, the Treaty of Waitangi. And then, just, just to change the, uh, from what Adam was talking about this morning, there was a scandal. There was a scandal and ethics actually came to, came to being with a, with, with a scandal called the unfortunate experiment between 1966 and 1982 a researcher um, named Herbert Green, he said that uh, carcinoma in situ was a, was a separate disease from and didn't lead to invasive cancer. So he basically uh, did a study of his patients without informing them that they were part of a, a, a trial. And uh, eight of those people died. The, 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 the parallels to Tuskegee are, are, are one of basically black men with syphilis and, and uh, white, uh, and these a woman uh, in New Zealand, but the conditions are exactly the same. So this is a major change. And uh, we have a, an outcome of that is something called the Cartwright Inquiry, where um, Judge uh, Sylvia Cartwright uh, 
had had a, an inquiry into the unfortunate experiment and found that this was outrageous, there was no informed consent, and we needed to have mandatory ethics review. Have we become too ethical? And the answer is no, because um, Her Herbert Green was working in a teaching hospital of a university, so it was only health and it was only universities who were uh, given ethics review. It was only mandatory for those two sectors. Exempt were local government, central government, NGOs, and community researchers. It would take another uh, 20 years for them to get uh, ethics uh, review, and I'll come back to that a little later. So, have we become too ethical? I think the answer is that it's very, very partial. But we have that State-Owned Enterprises Act, so every bit of legislation from now on has Māori at the table. And uh, Māori were at the, at the ethics table for, uh, in 1988, when the first 15 health and disability ethics committees were established, there were two Maori, two Maori members at, at each uh, on each committee, um, and every committee had to go through that partnership model of consultation. <coughs> the problem is that, in terms of operationalizing what consultation actually was, it was very poorly defined. Uh, it left it up to the ethics committees themselves to work out whether it was disparity or culture. And here was something that was not operationalized. There was a there was a, a, a real um, lack of fit. And Maui Hudson, writing in 2009, looking back, is basically saying that while Maori values are acknowledged on these ethics committees, they are not yet given equal weight in ethical deliberations. So, so I'm on these ethics committees. I've been on ethics committees for too long. Uh, so my background is I I, I joined a. Uh, I joined an ethics committee in 1995 because I went to an ethics committee for the first time. Um, I, I'd been to the University of California and I hadn't gone through ethics review, but I went to Massey University in New Zealand, my first job, and I was doing some research. And the local bishop said, well, this ethnography stuff, it's just journalism. Uh, and I sort of, uh, I kind of like bought the company after that. I, I, I joined it and I didn't know that that would become my life's work. I uh, was trying to sort qualitative research out. So I, I was a member of, of, of that university's ethics committee. I became the deputy chair of that committee. And then uh, four or five years later, I, I worked out that health was where the power was. So I moved over to a health and disability ethics committee when there were 15 regional health, health and disability ethics committees in New Zealand. The government, the government restructured ethics committees away from the patient in 1988. In 2004, the focus was on the researcher, how to make this review system better for the, for the researcher in 2004. And the Minister of Health appointed me the, 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 the chair of the multi-region uh, ethics committee in New Zealand and uh, deemed me an ethicist. So it's kind of cool. So I sort of got laid on hands. So, uh, and I, I served on that committee till 2009, and then I uh, hopped off the committee and then I was uh, looking for something else to do, so I, in uh, 2000 and, uh, about 2011, I started to form my own uh, ethics committee. Uh, it's called the New Zealand Ethics Committee, it's a great name, uh, New Zealand Ethics Committee. And it basically serves local government, central government, uh, NGOs and community researchers. And as of this morning, we've done 50 applications this, this year. So, uh, so this whole time I'm having to deal with this thing called Maori consultation, and I have, uh, and I started to, uh, started to. Uh, so I started in 1995. I wrote an article in 1999. Didn't have the guts to publish it, but then in 2002 I did, and it was called Parking Up Paralysis. And basically, I was ar arguing that when it came to uh, researching the general population of New Zealand, Pākehā were totally paralysed. They didn't know what to do with uh, if you were non-Māori. And uh, so I, I want to talk about how, how it is to, to research uh, intra-country uh, uh, cultures um, and uh, where non-Māori don't know how to sort of do, do uh, research when, when, when that, that's, that, that's involving Māori. So come up with Māori research, I'm arguing basically preachers to the choir. If you're Māori and you're doing Māori research for, 
for Maori, by Maori, uh, the consultation process is uh, quite straightforward. What's not, not, not straightforward is the general population. How do you consult? What does it mean to consult? Uh, and, uh, uh, and what broke the camel's back was I went, went to help uh, a postgraduate uh, students who were doing mock, mock ethics uh, applications and I noticed that that over and over again they were deliberately excluding Maori from their sample and I asked them why and they basically sort of said that they didn't have the wherewithal, they didn't have the cultural capacity to study uh, and, and to actually bring Maori into their, uh, into their projects. So there was a lot of self-censorship going on. So when you look at the university policies on the, there's, there's seven or eight universities in New Zealand. When you look at their ethics po policies collectively, it's, it's very clear that Maori consultation is essential when research involves Maori communities or issues. Yet what, what happens when research is not focused on a Maori issue or Maori communities? And that's what I call, um, what, what I call then paralysis. I don't use the word paralysis now. I use the term binary. I want to know what the binary is. I want to know uh, I want to know uh, if, if, if this is a very clear statement, there needs to be a statement, if, if you're not studying Māori, then you don't have to go through this consultation process. So, so New Zealand hasn't really come up with this uh, process. Are we, too, um, are we too ethical? We don't have a national statement. Australia has a national statement. Uh, uh, Canada has a, a national statement. And they have very, very, very clear guidelines on this binary. And so... I think when you leave things up to ethics committees and people, uh, you were mentioning Laura Stark. If you haven't, haven't had a chance to read Laura Stark's book, Behind Closed Doors, it's a brilliant ethnography of, of how uh, ethics committees actually uh, operate. And she comes up with this, well, she uses Gary Allen Fine's term uh, of an idioculture. And she's basically saying that each, each ethics committee is an idioculture, not a culture or a subculture, but an idioculture who who make up their own rules and then they use those rules as president as president for their next meeting. So I was interested in, in that and I was interested in uh, in uh, uh, Maori consultation. So I applied for a grant of eight hundred thousand dollars and was successful and ended up writing a book called The Politicization of Ethics Review in New Zealand. And what's driving changes? What's driving changes in New Zealand is the Ministry of Health, and the Minister of Health is really changing the things in 1988, 2004, and now 2012. So, um, in 2012, just by luck, just by coincidence, there was a major restructuring of the uh, of, of the Health and Disability Ethics Committees that I had previously served on when there was 15 of them, and I had shared the committee when there was seven of them, and now there's four of them. So we're actually sort of withering away the state of, of, of ethics review in New Zealand. And what we actually have is, uh, in 1988, when this, the Cartwright Commission was going on, was a real focus on the patient, the subject, and the vulnerable subject. In 2004, the focus was on researchers are not happy. We can actually create a, a, a new system. Uh, and in 2012, the system was designed primarily for pharmaceutical companies. And this was the way to attract uh, foreign, uh, foreign clinical trial companies to New Zealand. So there were four. And... I wasn't privileged here. You can actually, if you want to research these four ethics committees, they are open to the public. You can just walk in, say hello, and start recording. Their minutes are all online. Uh, I, I know a number of you at lunchtime were, were scrambling around to find out whether they were, they, they are online. Uh, so I had access to their minutes, and I had access to the four committees. And uh, so I went and did an ethnography of these uh, uh, these committees. And well, just very, very briefly, the, the restructuring of the Health Ethics Committee um, was basically, uh, if you don't get your hamburger within 10 minutes, uh, it's, it's free. Uh, but in this case, it was a 35-day turnaround time. 35-day turnaround time, it's, it's, a, it's a, and what that means is the committee only meets once. 
So there's no way to defer the application. No scientific merit, that's done by peer review. Uh, I think this is a British model. And there were less metal, uh, there were less members going from 12 to seven, less e expertise. And the most important thing in terms of Maori, in terms of trivialization, no longer Maori by right on, on the committees. No longer were they there by right. So what I did was I went to all four committees and I, and I studied their idio culture and, I, uh, and I, how they actually made decisions. And I also uh, uh, sort of focused on the, the, uh, the way that they reviewed uh, Maori. And uh, so I, I went to, to, to the four committees and what I discovered was that in terms of Maori, three, three committees really discussed Maori at all. Uh, one committee discussed Maori on every occasion. Every, every, every issue. So there was an idio culture working here, uh, and there was a particular member here who, uh, who uh, um, raised it on, on, on every single issue. Um, and, and so that was, that was interesting. And then it took about two months to get the minutes up on, on, online. Um, so when the minutes came up for for not the committee that, that always discussed it. There was this other committee that always discussed that, that, that discussed it on one occasion. On one occasion, every every application was discussing Maori. It's like, oh wow, what's going on here? Um, this doesn't make any sense. And uh, what actually happened was that uh, when I when I read the fine print, this person, this woman who was on the, the, the central committee that always reviewed Maori consultation was actually seconded to the other committee. And this is, this is what it looked like. So I've sort of focused, and I've, I've sort of taken out, she didn't comment on one or five, I don't know what the hell was going on there, but every, every other, every, there were 12 applications and every one was looking at to come Maori. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll explain to come to, to Maori in, in a, in a, in a second, but here she's saying, uh, I commend you, I commend you, I'm very concerned, I'm very concerned. So, uh, so every, every one was looking at, uh, so we're looking at the word tikanga. Actually, it generally means a Maori way of doing things. It's derived from the Maori word of, uh, from tika, meaning right or correct. When you go back to the Treaty of Waitangi, it's protection. It's protection only protection. So we're, we're going to protect uh, the, the customs of Maori. So no longer are we talking about health disparity, education, prison population. We're, we're talking about just the way uh, it's actually um, organized. So my colleague, uh, but, uh, my colleague uh, Barry Smith, who, who was Maori, um, and uh, wrote an article called A, a Cultural Turn, <laughs> the trivialization of indigenous research ethics in New Zealand, the post-2012 disability, uh, health and disability ethics committees. So when you look at what they're actually talking about in these, um, they're talking about etiquette in terms of, was the bone removed and replaced using a tikanga Maori, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, please acknowledge and demonstrate all understandings of the current Maori and since tissue samples will, will be obtained and that tissue uh, samples will be sent overseas. So it's all about etiquette, it's not about health uh, dis disparity. So uh, what I actually have here is something that, that's basically showing the sort of trivialization towards protection and away from participation and sort of a, uh, an, an importance of what was actually happening in 2012, I um, mean, 2007. So it's a re real shift away. Um, I think this, is, uh, this has become quite trivial and I think that in Canada, uh, they do things a lot better. And uh, in my last couple of minutes, I'd just like to talk about Canada and I, I, I have Canadian envy. Uh, I just think that this, this code of ethics, the TCPS2, the, uh, the, 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 the Canadian Tri Council policy, especially chapter 10 on qualitative research, it's, there's nothing better than that. And it was written by Will Van der Hunard, I think who was quoted somewhere along the lines this morning. And, 
and chapter nine is on, on indigenous re research. So we wrote about three articles on, on Canada, but I just wanted to sort of show you that in New Zealand there's an expectation that all research has to go through a consultation process, but we're not too sure what that process is. And I've been on an ethics committee for a longer, for too long perhaps. Uh, and, uh, but in, in Canada, the, the answer is, do you have to go through ethics review? Uh, do you have to go through indigenous consultation? Uh, and the answer is often no. So um, here are four, four cases where you must, you must go through consultation in New Zealand, but the answer is no in Canada. So if, if the research involves a small proportion of, an, of indigenous people, but are not intended to describe the characteristics of indigenous people, the answer is no, it doesn't have to go through a consultation process. And if you're interviewing a sample of indigenous people where the results are not uh, attributable to the communities which they may identify, the answer is no. But the answer to be of, of yes is where there's a formal, where there's a formal governance uh, structure or the next two are when the research uh, involving a sizable proportion of the community is indigenous people, is intended or anticipated, or even if you're not doing uh, research that's going to be focused on indigenous people but there's a sizable proportion of, of the population, the answer is yes. So in a sense, I think they've got the binary right. And it's the binary that was never operationalized by Kapa Bamari that led me in frustration back in 2002 to put my head above the, uh, above the uh, parapet and say, hey, we're paralyzed here. But we are working. We are working with the Minister of Health at the moment to uh, to make some changes here. So there is. So, I'm about to. This is my last slide. Okay. Have we become too ethical? Um, what do you mean by ethical? Uh, I, I I think this uh, this this morning we've been talking about research governance, about research ethics, about ethics and practice. We haven't talked about ethics and practice. We talked about situational ethics. Uh, uh, but uh, I I really think that what could be really useful is to have very clear, and, and also I've mentioned I I idioculture, uh, what could be really useful would be to have clear policies for ethics committees to follow and make the review process more predictable and more engaging for both the I ethics committees and for the researchers. So I think we have a long way to go. And I, I just like to, to sort of end by saying that I wanted to create the New Zealand Ethics Committee as the, mo as the most powerless ethics committee in the world. As a, as a sociologist, it's completely powerless. And, uh, and uh, you're most welcome to come and study us at any time. <laughs> Thank you very much.